try to be the only one left in this room. Well, after you go for 45 minutes, don't be surprised. <laughs> don't be surprised. <laughs> okay. All right. We're... So, here we are, continuing through the best possible thing we could be doing at this time. Studying God's Word together. Um, but good to be reminded that this is the National Day of Prayer, so we need to be in prayer for everyone, all of our family members, for the nation, um, just everyone. <clears throat> so, let's just jump right in to... 1 John chapter 3. We all sang it together, didn't we? <laughs> Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, or given to us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sins not. Whosoever sins has not seen him, neither knows him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might, be, he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the little children of, uh, of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, whosoever does not righteousness, is not of God. Neither he that loves not his brother. For this is the message that he heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. Not as Cain who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Why did he do it? Because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso has the world's, this world's goods, and sees his brother have need, and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth by your actions. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, you might underline this in verse 20, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep 
His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. And He that keeps His commandments dwells in Him, and He in Him. And hereby we know that He abides in us by the Spirit which He has given to us. Amen? Father, we do ask that You open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, you give us ears to hear, hearts that would be open to the message you have for us. Help us to receive everything that you have for each and every one of us individually this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So quite a few things we learned just from the first two verses about God's love. One of the reasons I did... All those songs were, were chosen and specifically selected just for this message in, in 1 John 3. And we talked about how 1 John, the, the first epistle here, can be divided up. Chapters 1 and 2 is showing us, and in, in the emphasis in chapters 1 and 2 was light. God is light. In Him there is no darkness. The emphasis now is shifting to the second part of the book in chapters 3 and 4 is God is love. And so the emphasis is love. And then when we get to chapter 5, you know, a year from now, I think we'll be in chapter 5. Just kidding. I think, kind of. Um, it'll be God is life. In Him there is life. So, light, love, and, and life. But here we are looking at love. And the first thing I learned about God's love, one thing I learned about God's love, is what manner of love this is. And another way of saying it is that this love is different. This love is very different. Um, we, unfortunately, in our English language, we have one word for love. It's love. And we, we, we know, we say, I love uh, my wife, I love my kids, I love chocolate peanut butter ice cream. Now I hope that my love for my wife is stronger than my love for chocolate peanut butter ice cream, right? So and we, have, we, we use that one word so liberally, so freely, sometimes we forget. And in the Greek, which is what this was written in, there are four different words for love. You had phileo, and that is a brotherly love, and that's where Philadelphia is, the city of brotherly love. or the, That's the meaning of the word Philadelphia. Um, phileo is, is that brotherly love. Eros is more of a physical or sexual kind of love. We would get our English word erotic from this word eros. That was the second word for used for love. And storge is the family kind of love that we have for our uh, sisters, brothers, mom, dad, son. But this word is agape, or agapeo. And it's a selfless love. And as I said, a very different love. So different. Um, another time this word, manner, is used kind of an interesting word, manner. Uh, behold, what manner of love. It's, it's really, actually, literally means what country or tribe. What manner is this love? Behold, what difference this love really is. Um, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 27, uh, the disciples were on the sea, and it was stormy, and Jesus, remember, rebuked the wind and the waves, and he said to, to peace, uh, be muzzled. Um, interesting, the disciples turned and said, what manner of man? Same idea here. What manner of man is this? That, that even the wind and the waves would obey. What kind of love is this? What kind of man is this? Um, in, John, in here it's, what kind of love? 
God shows to us. It's so different. It's so uh, sacrificial. In fact, Romans 5.8, uh, God displayed and demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And of course, John uh, 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, John 15, 13, than, than one lay down his life for his friends. We know it's, it's, it's a selfless, sacrificial, uh, unconditional love. Our love so often is conditional. I'll do this if. There's conditions. I will love you if. But his love, his love is amazing steady and unchanging. It's, it's as the psalm says, right? It's, it's amazing. It's, it's, um, in fact, I love this verse. You might jot down. Ephesians chapter 3. I don't have this one memorized. But Ephesians chapter 3, verse uh, 19. In Ephesians 3, 19. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. In other words, you will not have knowledge of this love. It passes your knowledge. It's, un, you, it's un, incomprehensible. It is completely um, out of our capacity to totally understand this. This love. So that's that's one thing we know. Another thing we know is it comes from the Father. Another thing about this love that I know, not only what manner is it, or it, that it's so different than the world, but now, number two from verse one still, it comes from the Father. And I might just make note here that there is no other source there is no other resource that you can find this kind of love. You will not find this kind of love in another person, a physical person, like your wife or your girlfriend or your uh, whatever. You will not find it in possessions, like a new car or like um, anything out there that Many people try to find this kind of love. It's not in possessions, not in people. You will not find it within. <laughs> to shut down the New Age belief and the, you know, just if you sit long enough with just yourself, you'll. Sorry, that's that's a recipe for misery, isn't it? <laughs> just meditate and meditate, and you'll find it within. No, it's only found in Him. The Father. It is given by the Father. The kind of love that we all need. And number three, the, the third thing I learned, not only is so different, it comes from the Father, but it is given unto us. It's bestowed. That word bestowed simply means given. And it's actually, the idea behind the word is given freely. It is freely given. He gives freely and liberally to any who come. And that tells you and I, and it reminds me, that this love is not something we work at or strive to achieve. We, we cannot um, merit it. It is not something we earn. It's freely given. God's love is so good. I could talk all day. And I just might. <laughs> Another thing about this love, and uh, something to jot down about it being freely given, Romans 8.32. I love Romans chapter 8. There's another chapter you can spend all day in. But Romans 8.32, um, He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. His love is freely given. It's bestowed upon you. And it's, it's just wonderful. It frees you and I up. It's unconditional. In fact, it's uh, 
despite my efforts. It's um, regardless of any of my own righteousness, which looks filthy, Isaiah tells us. My righteousness looks filthy. It's filthy rags in His sight. Anything I think that I could bring to the table, God looks at as just a rag that's used for cleaning up oil spills. Just a filthy rag in His, in his sight. Um, no, it's freely given. Another thing I learned about this, what manner is it from? It's so different. It comes from the Father. It is freely given to us, but it also enables me. It enables you to be called His Son. I like the old King James, sons of God. It's been translated to children of God. Anything new is going to always kind of that's why I say it waters it down a little bit. Makes it nice for the reader, right? Gender neutral. It's, it's not just sons or, or men only, but, but let's make it acceptable to some, some who might be confused what gender they are, right? That was a joke, but this day and age, you never know. Sons of God. One thing I like about that is, what is Jesus called? Son of God. The Son of God. Amen. That's that's three pastries for you after. Do <laughs> 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 you have to eat all that? <laughs> well, you can take them home. You know. <clears throat> but the Son of God, and now you and I, those who put their trust in and have, have been given this love, we are called sons of God. In other words, we are placed in the family with Christ, the Son of God. The, the, we become kids of the King. Amen? We, are, we become in the family of God. And it, caught, it, it enables us to be called children of God. We should be called children of God and not children of God of, of uh, darkness. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5, another phrase that you find this children of the light. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5. Um, It's been a while since I was in 1 Thessalonians. That's before Timothy. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of day. the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. For those insomniacs out there, let, let this be an encouraging word to you. Don't be those who stay up late, and, and who just, that's when I come out, is at night. Man, there's a lot of stuff going on at night that you want to be asleep, be it uh, the children, and, and it fits perfectly with the theme of 1 John so far, has been light. So we want to be children of the light, children of day. Now, there's nothing wrong with working graveyard shifts. I did that for a while, and, and you can still have a great relationship with the Lord. But there's a spiritual thing there where you want to be those who are in the light and not in darkness. Very open. Um, it, so that it enables us to be called the children of God. It also, though, don't forget the rest. We didn't sing this part, did we? The rest of verse 1. The world knows us not. So it not only enables us to be called children of God, but it causes the world not to know me, but also it call, it will goes a step further and will cause the world to hate you. Not only is the world just not going to know you, but uh, jumping down um, where he said uh, in verse 13, jumping down to verse 13, 1 John 3, 13, don't be surprised, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. And that's the idea. The world 
knows us not because it does not know Him. The reason that Cain was so upset with his brother Abel was because of this same thing. He didn't know the God that Abel was serving. And the reason the world looks at you and does not know you is, and, and then they find themselves hating you, they don't even know why. It's because they don't have this relationship with God. And the same thing works for those who get their eyes off of Christ, off of God, and onto the pastor, the teacher, or their fellow Christians. This is such a danger. I was just talking to somebody this last week. They no longer... Well, I grew up as a, as a churchgoer in a church, but then the pastor left, and they tried to get a new pastor, and it was just, it was just too hard, so we just don't go anymore. You stop going to church because the pastor's not there? I hope that's not ever the case here. If the pastor's not around, my relationship... With, is, is not with my dad. It's not with the pastor. It's with God. Get your eyes off of the man, the human, and back on God. Stop getting so upset with Christians and bring your anger where to God. And He can deal, deal with it. He will straighten you out. Last week we were looking at the Queen of Sheba coming and visiting Solomon. And one thing is hard questions. It says she had hard questions. Anybody have hard questions? Bring them. Bring them to the king. And he is the, the wisest king of all, not Solomon. <laughs> the, well, I'm talking about the king of kings. God, the Father, is the wisest. So if you have hard questions, if you have things that you think... And the pastor will be stumped with some of these questions. Because, can you lose your salvation? One of the most frequently asked questions. I don't know. How could any human know that? You would be God if you answered that question confidently and said, yes, you can lose your salvation. No, you cannot lose your salvation. You would be God, wouldn't you? There's things only God knows. And we get ourselves in all kinds of Messy situations and messes because we attempt to, to uh, look to a man, a human. Get your eyes off of humans and on the Creator. Off of creation and on the Creator. That's a whole other sermon right there. I don't need to go to church. I've got creation. That's my church. I go out fishing and I enjoy God's creation. Well, you're worshiping creation and not the Creator. So be careful. Beloved, uh, another thing that I learned. It, causes, it enables us to be called children of God. It causes the world to hate you, to, to uh, not know you. It will make me like Him. It will make me like Him. Look at verse 2 again. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. I love that. And it's, it's, it's so encouraging and so good. And this, if anything, brings to remembrance, and brings to our minds the rapture of the church. When we will be caught up, we will be taken out before the wrath of God is poured out. Um, Jesus Christ is coming back today. Maybe you didn't hear me. Jesus Christ is coming back today. And if not today, then we'll see tomorrow. Maybe next hour. But if you really lived life in light of that belief, Jesus Christ is coming back today, right now. What does it say? Uh, in verse 3. Every man that has this hope, it will purify you. You will be purifying yourself. 
1 John 3, 3. Great one for memory there. Every person who hopes and looks and says, Jesus Christ is coming back today, purifies himself. If you believe in mid-trip, if you believe in post-trip, and these are arguments that are out there, teachers, that, that will go and spin you in, in many different directions. I was there being, being told this view and that view, amillennial, and, and you get all the, into all these things. But any other view that forces you to say, well, I know Jesus is coming back, but it's not until three and a half years and right here, and then there's got to be a seven, seven more years. Just tune out. As soon as you hear any of that jargon. Is that a word? Yeah. <laughs> it is a word. Any, any of Surprising. That's a word. Okay. Any of that garbage, that nonsense. As soon as you begin to hear that, because why? I'm living life in light that Jesus Christ is coming back today. It's purifying. It's hope. Anything else is bad news. Gospel means good news, doesn't it? Anything else is bad news. If there's got to be this or this or this, no. We will be like Him. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, I wrote this down, 51 through 58, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall not all sleep, we shall be changed. That's where, when, right when you walk in, you see that. We will all be changed. At that sound of the last trump, we will be caught up, and we will be like Him. Amen. And that will require new bodies. Anybody excited about that? Yeah. I thought there'd be a couple of you. Glorious new bodies. It will move you to purity. And one thing we want to make sure we <clears throat> keep our eyes in, on, on uh, Jesus Christ and not looking for Antichrist. Some people get into 1 John and all they can do is get into that la what we looked at last week at the uh, spirit of Antichrist and they, they seem to get everything is on that. No, don't lose your focus. It's not about Antichrist. It's about Jesus Christ. Nothing wrong with doing a study on who the Antichrist is and what the spirit of Antichrist is like, but one way they can tell, and what Antichrist really is, is counterfeit Jesus Christ. It's, it's a counterfeit. So how can you tell a counterfeit? You study the real thing all day. Ask a banker. Anybody that works at a bank, how do they know when a counterfeit bill comes their way? They've been handling the real thing all day. That's the same way with you, with me. If you've been in a relationship with the real creator, the, G, the, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ, the real deal, and there is only one, then you're going to recognize that counterfeit. We don't have to worry about it. We'll be out of here by the, when the Antichrist arrives. Um, <clears throat> so, there's another thing here. It shows me, to, <laughs> kind of reviewing here, uh, how different this love is. It comes from the Father. It is freely given to us. It enables me and you to be called children of God. It causes the world not to know me, but to hate me. And it will make me be like Him. It will move me to purity. And it shows me the reality of sin. This love will show you and I the reality of our sin. And whosoever commits sin transgresses, verse 4, against the law. If you ever want a clear definition of what sin is, if you're, if you're confused, well, I don't know if this is sin or this is sin, right here, 1 John 3, 4, gives you a very clear and concise definition of sin. It is transgression or breaking the law. Question, who wrote the law? God. Amen. You're not going to get any 
you know, demerits if you get it wrong. Don't be afraid to shout out the answer. God wrote the law, which means if you break the law, you are, your sin is against Him. This helps you and I. And it, it's, it's a huge thing I always have to come back to. And that is when people sin, and it affects me. Now, sin will affect others around you. Their sin is not against you. Their sin does, it, it is not against you. It does not offend you. It offends God. It's against God, and it breaks God's heart. This, why is this so important? And if you need other scriptures for that, Psalm 51.4. David's sin, in Psalm 51, verse 4, he said, You and you alone I, have I sinned against. Wait a minute, David. Those of you who have read First and Second Samuel, those of you who have seen the story, we know the story, David sinned with Bathsheba. He, he looked down and saw her bathing there from his king's palace, the roof there, and he had her husband put out in the front line on that army line, and, his, and her husband was killed. You sinned against God? Yes, absolutely. That sin of lust and adultery did not offend anyone but God. It was not transgressing or breaking any law but God's law. Now, did it affect Uriah, her husband, to the point of death? That sin will affect people, but ultimately, your sin is against Him. Why is this so important to me? Why am I hammering this so much? Because we begin to think that people sin, it's against us. Then, we all of a sudden want revenge. We want things to be made right. So I have to get vengeance and I have to get even with her and with him because they sinned against me. No. When we really get this in view and we get our eyes back on God and off of people, when we really get this in view, we no longer are mad or upset or want revenge. Rather, we are broken. And we see what it has done to the heart of God. That God is heartbroken over this sin. And we no longer want revenge and vengeance. We want restoration. We want them to be restored in whatever place they're at. Wherever they're at. So don't forget that. That your sin is, is uh, against God. Now, with that in mind, why does he go so far in this letter, uh, in this chapter, chapter 3, talking about committing sin? And if you do commit sin, you are of the devil. And if you do not, then you are born of God. What he's talking about is abiding in sin. Because, verse 5, moving slowly through this chapter, you know that He was manifest, that is God, Jesus Christ was manifest to take away sins. That we would no longer be sinful. That we would no longer be, um, you know, lost and in that darkness and in that bondage that sin brings. Does it feel good? Yes. <laughs> everything my heart wants to do I'm getting to the title of the message now everything I want to do left to myself is destruction, destructive to me it will bring ultimately death the wages of sin is death if I go by my feelings if you let Disney run your life and do what your heart tells you to do, you will end in a mess, in destruction. Why? Scripture says the heart is deceitful, wicked. Who can know it? The one who's greater than your heart. 
Do you think you know the dreams, the aspirations you've got for yourself, all of the things that you have hoped for and you, you find yourself dreaming about and praying about? Those things will make you miserable. Ask Solomon. He had all the money in the world, a thousand, what, 700 wives, 300 mistresses, he had everything that you think you could ever want. Read Ecclesiastes sometimes. Sometime. And find out it, would, it brought emptiness. That's what Solomon said. Vanity. And it's, it's so true. You can learn in the sanctuary or you can learn in the storm. But you will learn. I hope and pray that I'm, those, that I'm among those who learn in the sanctuary, not learning the hard way. Read about these guys. We've been given this living book. Everything that's written in it is for our learning. It's for our example. It, it's, it's all there so that we would learn to not do these things that are, uh, that are causing... Um, what does sin do? Sin will affect our lives. It's ultimately against God. So what it does is it, uh, it divides you. It separates you. Uh, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Um, God is... is uh, His hand is not short. His arm is not short that He cannot reach. His ear is not deaf so He cannot hear. But it's your iniquity. Your sin has separated you from God. And that we had a sin problem before Christ came. We had that separation, that division. But then, praise the Lord, the, uh, Psalm 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, He has cast our sins, our transgressions. Same word that's used to describe sin in verse 3. And, uh, verse 2. 4, sorry. Uh, the, the transgressions, those things that we've, we've committed against the Lord, they've been cast as far as the east is from the west. In fact, Hebrews 10, 17, he, your sin will I remember no more. Not only does God forgive, God forgets. Something we humans have a very hard time doing. Not only does God forget, forgive, but he forgets all the right stuff. He puts the sins out into the sea of forgetfulness and he posts a sign that says, no fishing. And that's for you too. Your brothers, your sisters, that you might know their deep, dark secrets. You don't go fishing up and, and look at what they did, you know. You don't, we don't do that. We want to keep our eyes on him. And there's some very weird and strange stuff that comes up from Cain, who's mentioned. And they take, uh, false teachers will take that and say, Cain, who was of that wicked one, verse 12. And we don't want to be like Cain. <laughs> but, and that's the idea, is, is there's everything in the Old Testament is a spiritual picture that we see in the New Testament. It comes to life. And that's what the writer here is doing. He's showing us. But, but if you listen to some of the false teachings that, out, that are out there, at their root, their very root, is they say that Cain and Abel were not brothers at all. That the devil actually uh, impregnated Eve and that Cain was a product of Satan. Satan was the father of Cain. Not Adam. Adam was the father of Abel. And they make this weird distinction. None of that can be found in Scripture. And it is, even if it was, I was talking to Dad about this yesterday, if you take the physical genealogies and trace yourself back physically, to any, you find yourself getting into trouble and into all kinds of heresies. And the Scripture warns to not get caught up in genealogies, in fables, 
in things because you might be able to prove that physically Cain is the seed of Satan and, and that physically this or that. It doesn't matter. It's a spiritual lesson that God has given to us. And the point is not to be a murderer. <laughs> not to be one who hates his brother. Jesus said, not, not hatred, anger. Jesus said, have you been angry with someone? You're guilty of murder. I think about everyone in this room now is guilty. I know I am. Have you ever looked and lusted after a woman in your heart? Guys, you're guilty. Jesus took it right to, to the heart, didn't he? He knew how to shut up all the jargon. There it is again. All this stuff, all the, the nonsense, and just get it back to what it's all about. Love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And what does he come back to, John? It seems over and over in every chapter, he will, we see this phrase, love one another. Don't be like Cain, but love one another. Don't get caught up in jealousy and rage and wanting vengeance and to get even and to do this and do that. Hey, there's a story out there for everyone. Don't get caught up in those making excuses for your sin. But have compassion and know that there by the grace of God go I. We are just as susceptible, just as willing to walk away as you are. Nothing makes any one of us greater. Jesus is the only one. And I, I think what, I, what I've seen the most in 1 John in studying this is how Jesus on the cross makes a level playing field. You can be the king of whatever providence you're from. And you can be the lowest person. Guess what the cross does? It levels it. It don't matter who you are, where you're from, Jesus said all who are thirsty, all who are weary, who are heavy, laden down, and bummed out and depressed. And if you're joyful and everything's all together, you too can come. We, we get things com compartmentalized and and we put people in this category. We put things in that category. And I used to have a, uh, one of my favorite Bible teachers, Pastor Clark, down at the Bible college would say, we say category good, category bad. We really should have a category God. You lost your job? Oh, that's bad. You don't know. <laughs> we say, oh, that's bad. You don't know. It could be, and we should put things in category God. That was in God's hands. It's in God's hands. It's all God. Not it's all good, or it's all bad. It's all God. Amen? Amen. So he is, he is greater than our hearts. Another thing to note about the uh, David talked about, um, false gods. Um, this is kind of backing up to we will be made and become like him. Um, I like that because my name, Michael, means like God. <laughs> to be made like him. Um, the psalmist, David, would write about the gods of the enemy. And he said, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have feet, but they can't walk. That's the gods of, of the enemy. And he went on say, to say that those who worship them are like them, become like them. They have eyes, but they're blind. They have ears, they just don't hear the gospel message. They don't get it. They have 
they, they're, they're like just zombies. Ever see people like that? And you become like your God. It is a very plain and simple truth. If your God is false, you will become false. A false person. Someone who's shady. If your God is the living and true God, you're going to be made alive with Christ. And true and honest. That's the, the simple message, really. And I love this little kind of analogy because, again, he's not talking about legalism when he says, commit sin, don't commit sin. Do righteousness, and you'll be righteous. It's not legalism. Again, it's love. And this is a great illustration. A girl that's taken out on a date well, she's got a, a, a guy that picks her up for a date, and then she, he wants to go to a bar. And this is a good Christian girl that's been brought up. And, and she says, I can't go to that bar. You know, and uh, he says, why? Are you, are you worried about your dad going to hurt you or something if you go to that bar with me, if you do that? And she, her response is the, the greatest response. It's not what... My dad would do to me, it's what I, and how I might hurt my dad by going to the bar. That's what John is talking about here. It's not about that I don't do this or I do that because dad's going to give me a whooping if I, if I go there and if I do that. No, it's I will break my creator's heart and what I, what I would do to him, and that's the idea there. He came and he died on the cross to take away those sins. And now you're sinning? Now, we all sin. Every day we find ourselves sinning. But do you commit? And are you committed to sinning? That's another great way of remembering this. So you don't get into legalism and thinking, well, there's no, it's impossible. There's no Christians then out there. Because we all sin. Yeah, but are we practicing and committed to sinning every day? No. I hope not. We are committed to Jesus Christ. That's where our commitment is. And we want to be those who are born of God. That's another thing that, that he brings out. You will never be able, and I like this too, you will never be able to breathe water. Why? Because you're not a fish. <laughs> kind goes after its own kind. You are born a human, so guess what you breathe? Air. If you are born of God, you're going to be someone who does not want to sin. And you're going to be heartbroken. You're, it's going to be something you struggle with. Sin is something we struggle with. It's not something we just carelessly continue to do and we're just over and partying. If you find yourself comfortable sinning, watch out. Repent. Because it's very easy to get in those areas where it's you find yourself really comfortable. You know, Whatever it may be. Thank you, God. Amen. Well, thank you, Father, for your word this morning. Thank you that our sins are not only forgiven.